put in this clip. Okay, and then uh, just one more thing. I'm gonna check. Does this work? Yes, it does. All right. So, okay, here we go. Uh, sorry for the online presence here. Um, I think in the last lecture, we were talking about uh, package managers. Sorry, the zoom bar is right in my way. Um, <laughs> okay, we we'll have to deal with it. Um, so you're we talking about package managers. There's a few more things that I want to talk about regarding uh, Python that I think are gonna be useful for you to know. Um, so one is multi-threading. So I'm not sure how many of you have tried uh, to run uh, parallel processes on Python. Uh, Python does have a threading library. The tricky bit is uh, it's not fully uh, parallelized. So this is because when Python was developed um, in order to, so Python has a garbage collection uh, system. So you don't have to deallocate memory that uh, objects that you instantiate kind of allocate. Because of that garbage collection system and the way it's implemented, um, you cannot have uh, true parallelism. So uh, for Python, I think all the V3s, uh, so version three of Python, um, if you want to run parallel, parallel tasks uh, at, 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 and you want them to be decoupled, you have to actually run parallel processes. So um, you'll have to start multiple Python instances and each Python instance is going to be delegated to run some of the work that you you need, to, you need to you need to process. So let's say you have a large array of data that you have to process. You'll say, okay, the first ten elements of this array are going to be processed by Python uh, by the Python process one. I start another Python process that's going to take the next twenty, like the, the elements ten to twenty, and then I start another Python process that takes elements. Uh, 20 to 30 and so on. Um, so I think Python has this, these uh, libraries that allow you to start multiple Python uh, processes. You can you can see an example here. This is multi-processing, it's not multi-threading. I'm not sure how many of you know the difference between multi-processing and multi-threading. So maybe a, uh, just a very brief note. Uh, threads uh, are similar to processes where you can run multiple computational operations in parallel. Uh, it, the, the difference between a thread and the process is the threads can uh, re, can have access to the same memory of a process. So a, a process can have multiple threads and the process, like if you look up here, this is the memory region of a process and all the threads have access to this memory region. If you have multiple processes, uh, multiple processes cannot have access to their to the memory region of another process. So one process has its own, like this is a, a single process. Um, and if I have another process here running in parallel, uh, this process does not have access to the memory of this other process. So uh, you can you can have inter-process communication, but um, with threads, you can reach into the memory address space much easily, more easily. So just FYI, we had uh, capstone projects like we were to Triumph, and it's we spent like two weeks or so trying to optimize some code, and it uh, after two weeks we realized <laughs> we realized that it was uh, the the fact that we couldn't run multiprocessing. So this is this idea of the global interpreter lock with the the gil was preventing us from uh, speeding up the code. So keep that in the back of your mind. Python is not fully multi-threaded. Um, and then last thing I want to say about Python, um, if you work um, on, on open source projects or you work on your uh, I don't know, engineering design team or even, even for this course, it would be, uh, it's very useful to have a common way in which you format your code. Um, so this would allow other people that read your code or want to contribute to your code to more effectively uh, understand your code. So the there's some rules. <laughs> there's actually a very large amount of different standards. One standard is called PEP8. And here you can see kind of a, a list of uh, rules. These are kind of like how your code looks, the formatting of your code. Um, and it, it can be enforced by a, a, like almost like a syntax checker. Uh, you know how in Word you can underline words that uh, 
are spelled wrong. So the same way with this, uh, you can say, I want to use PEP8 and I'm going to use a linter to ensure that the PEP8 standard is adhered to in my code. So it's going to check that uh, you have four spaces per indentation level. You, your lines are no longer than 80 characters. Uh, so you can easily scroll through them um, in a single dimension. And then, yeah, so these, these are the different rules. Um, I encourage you guys so uh, to use uh, some sort of uh, standard code for formatting, uh, so, so standard format for uh, formatting your code. Uh, Pepe, I think, is a pretty good one. Um, all right. The, I can't see if anybody is asking questions or not. So as I said, put it in Discord. I have it open here. So hopefully, I can. if you guys need something, I can see there. Uh, for Python, I have some references here that you guys can use. I really like the real Python tutorials. I think these are this is a very good resource to have access to, and that and also um, just the the Python library uh, documentation. So I I like to have in my bookmarks kind of uh, easily. At, at a, I try I'm trying to bookmark important documentation um, uh, standards. So if I need to go to the Python one, I just have it here, and I think I've added it to your uh, Linux image too. So you should have it there. Uh, for the lab, when the lab starts today, I'm I'm kind of recommending you guys to go through the um, Python and NumPy tutorial from uh, Stanford University here. Um, okay, and as a reminder, on on the course website, uh, we have uh, I have a, a a notebook in Collab, so this notebook here, um, that is this is just an implementation of everything we are discussing in, in the lecture today. So. Um, I'm gonna skip up. I think so. We are talking about decorate decorators at some point, packages, multi processing, and environments here. Okay, so you can you can kind of keep track of what I'm doing in the collab, and if you want to test something, you can easily just copy that collab in your uh, uh, Google Drive and then run it and modify it to see whatever you want to do. Uh, okay, so we talked a bit about Python. Python is also very useful for. Um, developing kind of visualization tools and uh, I think it's visualization is kind of a very important skill to develop in parallel with uh, all your other technical skills this is a it's a very um, it's a skill that you can use to persuade people uh, in it. it's kind of like a, a superpower and having good visualizations so uh, good ways to look at the data uh, can can convey kind of the, the essential uh, takeaways much much more easily. Um, it's uh, you like I I didn't realize it until I saw it done well. Uh, we had at uh, Borel one of the um, one of my coworkers who's also a fizzer. He was an, a wizard at uh, creating really insightful visualizations, and this was kind of a, a, a combination of him coming up with good plots, but then also having the skills to trans translate those thoughts that he those plots that he had in his mind into plots that into the two with the, by using the tools that he had uh, into actual visualizations. So uh, we are not um, we are not humans are not meant to look at large matrices of numbers. You cannot easily derive uh, an, an intuition of what these numbers mean by just looking at, at like vast amounts of uh, numbers. So there's our visual processing uh, system is much better uh, designed to process patterns. So what we want to do is take whatever data we have in tabular format or numerical format and somehow distill it into images. And then when we see images or visual cortex, can extract the patterns much, much uh, better than us kind of analytically going through numbers. Uh, so when you design things um, to be visualized, you have to keep in mind different uh, different ways in which you observe things. So for example, we have a much easier uh, time determining how big something is if it's in, if it's kind of on a, on a linear plot. So this is what I'm trying to say here. So it's the same data in a, in a um, pie shape, a uh, pie, pie graph here. It's difficult to say whether you know D is twice as large as A. 
or z is twice as large as z. But if you put it as a linear plot here, like a histogram, uh, it's it's you can at a glance kind of almost within I don't know half a second to a second say something about this. So when you present data, and this is you'll see it also in in capstone projects. Think about you have many ways in which you can present it. Think about which way is uh, an effective at highlighting the the message that you want to co uh, convey. Um, and sometimes you know you don't need you know the, you don't need plots. You might use ta tables, and you'll you can you can use them in different ways. Um, the idea is <clears throat> um, we we want to develop an understanding of the pattern in the data. So then that then we can use that pattern to control things in, the, the, in whatever way you want. Uh, and here is an example kind of with a table. Um, this is a table from uh, one of the courses that you might take at some point. So this is like 481. Uh, in this table, you have kind of four different solutions that you want to uh, determine which one you want to implement. And the solutions are one, two, three, four. If you look at this data like this, it's difficult to figure out, okay, what's a good solution? And uh, some some solutions the higher the number the better others the lower the number the better and this is again kind of develop your visualization toolbox if you just color code the solutions kind of so say okay on on uh, on this for for this particular table um i i have different so uh, a green would be in this in this row would be a, a, a good um uh, design or a good metric and red is kind of the value of this metric is bad. So now if I look at the solutions, kind of at a glance, I can tell, okay, solution two and three, they have a lot of red. So maybe they're not ideal. Solution four doesn't have, it's not very extreme. So it doesn't have a lot of bad things happening. Maybe this is a good solution. And solution one might also be a good solution. I can easily focus on these two to further evaluate. And this is just by adding colors. So looking at this, not very intuitive, adding color, all of a sudden I'm kind of, using my visual cortex to process the data more effectively. Um, <laughs> you will, we'll, we'll work on this in, during the capstone projects. Also for when you do your, for your competition, I think it's very important to visualize the data that you have. We'll, we'll talk about this probably in next week too, when, after you do this lab this week. Um, okay. Uh, so with, in Python, there's a few different uh, tools that we can use to visualize data. The one that I think most of you have probably heard is matplotlib. Um, and in matplotlib, you have many, many different ways in which you can plot data. And there's also Seaborn and Plotly. I'm not sure if anybody has used these. Uh, Plotly is actually fairly powerful because it's, uh, um, you can deploy it on online, so on a website fairly quickly. Um, you guys can Kind of more take a look at these. Uh, I like Matplotlib. It has really good tutorials also. Um, and you can click around. Uh, I'm not going to dwell too much on it. I'm just going to say one thing about Matplotlib that took me a while to figure out. Um, and then if you go online, you'll see different solutions, and you'll um, you'll be constantly debating with yourself if you don't know this about this. Why is this solution written like this while these other solutions are written in a different way? Um. Uh. Okay. Okay. Uh. Andrew. So sorry. I'm just looking on Discord here. So Andrew asked, "What's the difference between multi-threading and multi-processing?" Um. Let, let me finish with Matplotlib, and then I'll I'll go to multi-threading and multi-processing again. Because uh, I think that's fairly important to know. Um. So with Matplotlib, uh, one thing that you need to know is um. Um. You need to there's two ways in which things can be implemented. One is kind of a quick and dirty way where your matplotlib variables live in the global space of, of Python. Uh, and this is where you just say, okay, I'm going to import the matplotlib package as plot. And then you have a global uh, object, a plot object that, with which you can plot. And everything kind of stays as a single plot. This is kind of throughout the instance, uh, that the, the Python instance, uh, you are running, uh, you are sharing all the data with this plot object. So you can only do in a way kind of like a, 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 a single plot. Well, if you're in a Jupyter notebook, you can have multiple plots, but you would you would have a single object that's the plot object. Another way you can do it is um, you, can you can create your own plotting 
tools. So here, before I plot, I first create a figure object. And then this figure object, I add axes. And then in, in with these axes, I can plot things. So this is, uh, so on the left here, this is quick and dirty. You don't need to create any objects. You're kind of using the standard plotting object. On the right here, you are creating your own plotting objects, and then you use those. And this is much more uh, configurable, and you have um, kind of control of uh, of the details of the plots uh, at a much finer level. Um, but it takes more lines of code to uh, put into place. So here you'll, um, I think a lot of times what you guys will do when, when you have something quickly to plot, you'll just do it this way, but you don't have access to all the functionality. Uh, of the plot, and then if you want to, let's say, build plots to put in tape in, in your final reports and whatnot, when you need more details, uh, you would probably do it in, in this way. So here you can add probably two axes or multiple axes that uh, you can plot on and whatnot. So th this is this is it for plotting. I just remember there's two ways in which you can use Matplotlib. One is kind of object-oriented, and the other one is kind of uh, using the, the objects in, in the in the, the global objects of format for lab. Um, okay, so uh, before we move on, let me let me go, go back quickly to the uh, uh, multiprocessing and multithreading. So the, the main difference between processes and threads is that uh, a thread can have access to the memory. Uh, so threads run in, so you can have multiple threads running in a single process, and each thread can access the same memory the other threads are accessing. So you can share information much more easily between threads in a single process. If you want to do multi-processing, multi, uh, processing, you have to instantiate multiple processes, and each process actually does not have access to the memory address of other processes. So if you want to share data between processes, the task is much more involved and there's a higher overhead. Um, th that's kind of the, the gist of it in a way. So we can, we can discuss more about that. And Python cannot do um multi-threading uh, it can do multi-processing uh, for now i think there's there's some work to get python to do multi-threading uh, also but um, that's not implemented yet okay so we are <coughs> we are done with the uh, python so this took a bit longer than expected but we're done with that and now we are gonna before we go into any kind of neural networks and on i want to guys, give you guys a, a a glimpse of what the computer vision so you can use neural networks in very different settings but in our case uh, we are going to use it mostly for computer vision applications and before we use it for uh, neural networks i want to show you how um neural network how computer vision was done before neural networks came on the scene and this is going to offer you a, a perspective on okay this is how things were done before and this is how things are done now the way things were done before are still i think uh, effective and it's fairly useful to know about them uh, because they are uh, sometimes they are quicker to implement, uh, but more importantly, they are much more deterministic. You understand much better how they work and when they fail. Uh, with neural networks, that's a it's a it's a more complicated business of trying to understand when when things will fail. Um, uh, yes. Uh, sorry. So Spencer was saying something about multi-threads and multi-processes there too. Uh, I think most people can uh, use multiple tasks that you can. Um, uh, I th the the way yeah the threads can run. You can you can allocate threads to. It's it's more it's more complicated in a way. Spencer is right. Uh, you can have hyper-threading where you run multiple threads on the same core with the. You can have multiple threads in the for the same process running on multiple cores too it's complicated uh the schedulers are becoming very very smart okay um computer vision so this is going to be kind of the the first part of computer vision we'll also do computer vision with neural networks which is kind of a, a different uh different type of solution so before we we jump into computer vision remember these are the the, the tools that we are using here were hand designed by somebody uh, maybe it took, yeah, as I said here, for the last 100 years, someone or a group of people at multiple times, um, they developed some tools and then others built on upon these tools and kind of daisy chained them to achieve different things, um, different solutions. So I call these, this type of, these tools artisanal. 
So where humans kind of design the tools. Uh, with neural networks, what the way we set things up is we, we create a, a system that then we uh, we let loose kind of on the data and the system change, changes shapes. It kind of, it changes its abilities to conform to uh, a functionality that allows it to solve the problem we want. So it's no longer that us humans are creating the tools. We just kind of instantiate the seed and then the, that seed is going to uh, grow into a, a solution that uh, into a program that solves our problem. It's a, it's a very different type of uh, approach. And this is where machine learning comes in. So the machine learning is the machine learns how to solve the problem without the human human's intervention. It's a different art. Okay, so the artisanal tools, the, the tools that we created, uh, how, how do they work? So before, before I go into that, I want to make sure kind of you guys have, I think most of you know about this, but I notice that some sometimes don't. Um, the way we process reality around us is visually. So I think I think 80% of our information is actually coming through our eyes. Something like, I don't know, 15% is auditory and then the rest is the other uh, senses we have. Uh, but on the information that we get through our eyes, we get it in through uh, different types of receptors. So you have color receptors and then you have uh, light, um, dark receptors. Um, the color receptors, I'm going to focus mostly on, the, on these, um, are, are of three types and they detect um, somewhat different wavelengths of light, but the, our perception of what color is, is not actually the, the wavelength of the light that we perceive. It's more kind of the response intensity of the, a combination of these sensors. So if I want to perceive green light, what I need to do is this particular green receptor that I have, its intensity has to be, uh, I don't know, uh, let's say this is intensity of one, and then the red receptor should receive 75% uh, of the intensity of uh, the green receptor. And if I have this particular combination, I can tell that's a green light. But I can I can have the same ratio in a, with different wavelengths. So let's say I would be somewhere here where I have the at 500 nanometers intensity, I get the green light, and then I get kind of the red light at the, the, the same wavelength, but the same intensity, or the 75% intensity, and I can still see it as a green light. And this is sometimes magenta. Magenta is not actually a, a color. It's a combination of you seeing blue light and red light. So it's, it's two different wavelengths of color, of light, sorry, that you perceive as a color that doesn't really exist. So it's a, it's not a, the colors that we see are not a one-to-one -one mapping to the wavelengths that are in the light that hits our eye, which is fairly interesting um, to think about. And this is dif different animals have different color receptors and they see the world in a very different ways. And this is where I'm thinking like you can uh, use neural networks or more advanced techniques uh, to design solutions that are um, seeing the world in different ways. And then maybe they are more powerful. Um, they, they can solve problems in, in that with, with just these three color receptors you couldn't uh, solve. Um, so this is kind of us, the humans. Now for com machines, uh, because the machines were built on uh, trying to uh, replicate what humans, our abilities are, we for machines, we used similar kind of uh, patterns of light. So this is, we are looking at colors that are similar to the color receptors that uh, humans perceive. So that would be red, green, and blue. Um, and the way the way I think about it, and hope, I'm not sure how many of you are aware of this, but I'm just gonna kind of go through it. Hopefully at some point you will, you might already know about this or this is new to you. Um, you you'd have, let's say an object um, that uh, you shine light on it and then some light uh, reflects off it um, and it's going to go into the vision system that we use, so a camera more or less. Um, and the, cap the, the system starts with the lens that focuses the light um, and it focuses the light on a sensor, but before the sensor is kind of here, it consists of photodiodes, so these are little electrical devices that uh, when photons hit them, uh, they uh, accumulate electrons in a, in a, you can imagine like a capacitor or something like that. And then you can read, depending on how many uh, photons hit, hit the sensor, you'll, you'll have accumulating voltage on in this capacitor, and then you can read the voltage 
And then based on the voltage you read, you can infer how many photons had hit that detector. So, okay, you have a big lens that focuses the, the light around the, the sensor. And then the sensor itself is actually composed of a few different things. So this is a sensor, I think it's a, it's a foam sensor. And the sensor first has uh, micro lenses. So these are very small lenses above each sensor. Um, then after the, these very small lenses, you have uh, filters, and the filters ensure that only certain colors uh, go into the into these uh, receptors. So you'll have red, green, and blue uh, filters, and then these little filters, each one is sitting on top of one of these sensors, and then you have the sensors that are actually reading the light. Um, then here you can see how you have more green sensors, green filters than red and blue. This is to mimic the uh, sensitivity of the human eye to green light. So for some reason we have we are more sensitive to green light, um, and the, the most cameras have multiple uh, sensors that are reading green light than like uh, blue and red. Um, and then you have the actual the photodiode that detects the 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 photons of that particular color. And these photodiodes uh, are being read. You'll have like an ADC uh, circuitry that reads each one of these uh, sensors. Um, and th those values get added to a memory, like they, they get read to memory. And then the, the way we set up that memory is in, uh, in channels. So we say, okay, we have all the values for the red sensors, all the values for the green sensors, and all the values for the blue sensors. And uh, when I when I saw this, I was like, wait a second. So I'm missing the values of the red sensors where this green uh, sensor is. So what what happens here? Do I do I do I have a missing value? The the way these um, arrays are populated is that um, you are interpolating between these two pixels here. So and the, the these individual uh, sensors are called pixels. And uh, I think you're probably aware of that. Um, so if you if you are missing uh, the red pixel because you have these other pixels in between, you interpolate between this value and that value. So you, you average it. You say, okay, what's the value of this one? What's the value of that one? I'm going to average it, and I'm going to call this one um, the average of these two. Um, and the same with blue and green. Uh, and then you get this array in different channels. So you have a red channel, a green channel, a blue channel. So you'll, you'll hear RGB images. So that's kind of, it refers to R, G, and B in, in your channels here. And most sensors on your phone or on your on the standard cameras are 8-bit sensors. So that means that when you read the values from these pixels, you have 2 to the 8, 255 values that you can read uh, for each color. So red can go from 0, which is no red, to 255, which is full red. And then green is the same and blue is the same. So you have 8-bit uh, Three channel images. Um, then you have m by n sensors. So this would be the resolution of your image. Uh, so m by n is the resolution, and then uh, three is the number of channels. You can have multiple channels uh, depending on how fast your camera is. So we had a project. Um, this was a, a camera used for neurosurgery for cancer patients. So they were shining light and at a very uh, wide uh, spectrum. And that camera had 300 different channels. So you could read 300 different wavelengths. So instead of red, green, blue, it had many different types of red, many different types of green. And I think it would go into ultraviolet and infrared. So you can, you can depending on how fancy your camera is, you might have many more channels than uh, three. Okay. Uh, okay, so no questions here. Let's keep going. So this is this is how the camera kind of translates information from the real world into the digital world. This is what we'll mostly operate with. I just want you guys to be aware of these things. Um, another way you can think about how this information is being processed, so remember this is the real world and it goes into the camera, through the lens, uh, onto the, the, the sensors, and then you read, read out the image. Another way you can think about this is um, a lot of times what we want to do is not only kind of get information from the outside world into the, into the camera. What we want to do is say something about, okay, this is the image I'm seeing on the camera. I, sh I want to say something about where, how, how does the real world look like based on this image? So you have a 2D image, and from this 2D image, you want to say something about the 3D uh, representation that generated this image. And um, the, the, the 
processing that's being done to kind of go back and forth between the 3D world and the 2D image that you have um, is, is a lot of time split into you know two different components of, of uh, processing. So one is called kind of the extrinsic parameters, so the, the, the extrinsic transformations you need to apply to the information that you have um, to generate some to generate understanding of reality. And the other one is called the intrinsic parameters. So the extrinsic parameters are um, uh, computations that you need to do to uh, determine, okay, from the lens of the camera to the real world, um, how how is that? How are the pixels kind of being generated or being transformed? So these these would tell you something about kind of the orientation of the camera with respect to the real world and kind of the location of the camera in the in the real world. Um, so for example, in in the one of the you, you might have seen the air hockey table project uh, that we have in the lab. Uh, when we position the camera above the table, we want to know. So you have the air hockey table kind of. Uh, in the camera on top of it, and the camera looks for the puck on the table. In order to determine kind of the orientation of the camera with respect to the table, we would calibrate the extrinsic parameters of the camera. So you say, okay, I'm going to take images. I'm going to figure out where the corners of the table are uh, in reality with respect to the camera, and then where are the corners of the table on the camera image. Um, and then you can you can get like a orientation of the camera. So what is its um, kind of angle, like angular position, and then kind of distance from the camera, from the table, that, from the, thing, uh, the object that you want to image. And then another set of parameters are called the in intrinsic parameters. So these are parameters, it's, it's intrinsic because they are inside the camera. Uh, and these are parameters that you need to calibrate to understand kind of how the image gets projected from the lens onto your, onto your sensors. And uh, when a camera is being assembled, uh, the lens and the sensors are not always perfectly aligned. So it's not that the sensor is perfectly aligned on the optical axis of the lens. So when the camera is assembled after the assembly, uh, they or either the, the manufacturer or a lot of times we do it too. So to ensure that we have good calibration, we show the camera a particular pattern and then we try, we, we uh, re, we kind of we have transformations that allow us to say, okay, the pattern I'm seeing should be moved up or down or kind of rotated a bit so that the um, pixels that are high, uh, that are activated by the pattern uh, map the fact that, okay, this is right in front, of, like on the optical axis of the camera. Or um, the lens that we use uh, might introduce distortions. So you might have heard of fisheye lenses. So actually, I'm showing that here. So the fisheye lens would kind of take... Um, Information is coming at a at a at an angle to they're not it's not coming from the front it's coming from the sides and kind of projected on as if it's coming from the front uh, and this is going to distort the image and it's going to distort it more uh, it's going to distort the image more on the sides than in the center so you need to have a transformation that says okay for the pixel values that are on the side of the image I need to remap them so that they are. Uh, that they they show undistorted, and there's different types of uh, undistortion techniques that you can use. So here I'm showing some of them. So uh, for this is a barrel distortion, I guess, and you can you can uh, undistort it um, uh, using different techniques. So the idea here is you have extrinsics and intrinsic parameters. In our case, uh, most for for the competition, you have a, you just do a inverse perspective transform to uh, undo some uh, the the perspective. Uh, projection of the image on your camera, um, and but I think that that's about it. So you you we won't go into too much details about intrinsic and extrinsics in in this course, but I think it's going to be very useful for um, a lot of the capstone projects that we have in the lab. Um, and as I said, there's there's lots of references at the bottom if you guys want to learn more about that. Okay, so this is this is kind of it for the hardware part of the computer vision. Um, now we'll we'll kind of focus on the software. Um, so for the software, uh, in computer vision, you can use a lot of different uh, packages. There's a lot of different libraries. The one that has become kind of the de facto uh, package is called OpenCV. This was started I don't know, 2010-ish um, by a few different groups, uh, like big big companies. So Intel was uh, founding partner. I think there were a lot of others, um, and it it's a it's a a library that has a lot, 
yeah, I think most of the standard computer vision algorithms already implemented for us. And the good thing is that it runs both in uh, Python and in C++ or C. So you, um, you can you can very quickly prototype with it in Python. And if you like uh, the results that you're getting and you want a much higher speed and kind of efficiency, you can just recode that fairly easily. It's a, almost a one-to-one -one mapping into code that's uh, running in C++ and you can deploy it uh, as such. And it's also probably have it available in Java. You can run it on your phone and whatnot. Um, the core kind of data structure that uh, OpenCV uses is this mat object. Um, so remember how I was talking about these matrices of different colors um, that would be capturing this mat object. And the mat object has, as I mentioned, has kind of a, a height by width for normal images that you see that have three channels. So it's height by width by three. Um, the, the three here stands for red, green, blue, or uh, the order here makes sure different different formats uh, of files have different order. So you might have blue, green, red, so BGR or RGB, red, red green, blue, uh, but it, it it captures the, the color channels. And also, yeah, OpenCV has, I think, some fairly good tutorials um, that you, can, you guys can look into. Okay, so now some, some techniques here that we can use. So um, when data comes in, uh, it comes in as uh, a colored image most often. Um, a lot of times, uh, what what I the way I think about it is when I develop uh, these artisanal tools that I, I myself kind of put together to uh, solve a problem, I like to uh, take this multidimensional data. So I have three channels and width by height uh, amount of data. I want to kind of compress it into a very small data set. So I don't, I no longer want three channels. I want a single channel. And instead of um, width by height, I want just a tiny bit of a, a smaller area in here that highlights the feature that I'm interested in. So with with uh, these red, green, blue uh, colors, spectrum like images, you can modify them so that they're just grayscale. So now uh, the way you can do that is by averaging all the different channels here. So you say, hey, I'm going to take the red, average that with the green, average that with the blue. Or you can look at a single channel and be like, hey, I want instead of, I, I only want to look at the red channel. Maybe I'm looking for a stop sign or something. Um, and then that gets converted to a grayscale image. Uh, and the grayscale image is a single channel. So instead of being n by n by three, it's just n by n by one. And the the values in that grayscale image for each pixel um, normally would go from 0 to 255. So you'd have um, another 8-bit number that you can represent each pixel with. Um, so these these kind of, this is a, you can imagine kind of you, you reduce the dimensionality of your data. Another way you can reduce the, you can reduce the dimensionality even more, instead of having um, 255 different values, you can have only two diff two values, so black and white. So maybe um, I want to threshold these values. So here, what I did was I, I probably in this image, and you, you guys can look into the code here uh, to see exactly what I did. But uh, I, I think I probably threshold the image so that it shows only certain, yes, only certain. Uh, so I'm looking at these grayscale values, and I say, okay, if it's the value of this grayscale is below a certain level, so uh, maybe I don't know. Uh, maybe below 50, just keep it as, um, uh, as make it make that value zero. And if it's above 50, make that value a one, so maximum. Um, so all the values here, because they were above 50, they have to be turned to uh, uh, one. And these values, because they were below 50, they have all been turned to zero. So the black is zero, the, the white is uh, one. Most often what you'll see is instead of zero and one, you'll see zero and 255. Um, so you, you still have only two values, but those values are zero and 255, because zero and 255 can be more easily uh, represented here on the image. And uh, so a lot of times you'll see these uh, referred to as uh, binary masks. And it's a, it's a binary, uh, binary mask because it can be used to um, to mask different uh, components of a picture. So if you have um, a mask like this uh, with zeros and ones, and let's say I, I take this mask and I multiply this 
uh, it's not matrix multiplication. It's kind of just a one-to-one -one multiplication. I take this mask and multiply it, let's say, with this uh, particular uh, image here. So I take this, multiply by that. So wherever I see a zero, that part of the of this image that I, I have is going to go to zero. And wherever I see a one, this part of the image where there's a one is going to stay unchanged. So it's gonna it's gonna still stay at this color, or maybe we, we can go to the, uh, we can use it this uh, this RGB image here too. So you can multiply this mask with each one of these channels. Wherever there's a zero, you actually erase that information. There's n the the value of the pixel at that location goes to zero. Wherever there is a one in in the mask, the value of the input of this image stays at whatever value it was. So you don't actually erase that information. So when you apply the mask, it it's almost like it's hiding everything that's zero, and it keeps only the the val the pixel values that are mapped to are kind of equivalent to the ones in this mask. Does that make sense? How you kind of <clears throat> you can create a I can I can highlight and erase different parts of the image by using the mask. Hopefully that made sense. <clears throat> well, okay. <laughs> I'll keep going here. <clears throat> so that's a, this is a very common technique that you guys will use. So remember these these little stars here. These are going to be uh, I I put them in for slides that I think you're going to use for the competition. So you can highlight different regions of the image, and you can focus the computation on on those regions using these uh, binary masks. We have that. <clears throat> um, other tools that we you'll use a lot is. Um, it's kind of um, this is a very common tool used in many different settings. Blurring, so you wanna you wanna kind of make the image a bit um, fuzzy, and the fuzziness here can be implemented in different ways. Um, I think you took your, your uh, signal sense system class, and you probably learned about a bit about convolution uh, and blurs and low pass filtering. Um, the the way. Uh, I, I kind of, my intuition for how this works is I have an, an image, let's say something like this, and I'm gonna <clears throat> blur it using a, a, a filter here. So the, this is the kind of a low pass filter. And the, the low pass filter is applying a convolution, which is, which is this process of you know, combining the information from multiple regions around a particular pixel I'm interested in. So let's say I take this pixel here um, and I wanna, convolve it, like blur it with its its adjacent pixel. So what I do is I I am gonna bleed information from the adjacent pixels into this pixel here. And the way I do it is I take, I have, I have let's say you have this kind of box filter here um, and you say something about, okay, I'm gonna take the, the value of the pixel here plus the value of the pixel there, plus the value of the pixel there, plus the value of the pixel there, plus this one, plus that one, plus that one, plus, that one, plus the center one. I'm going to average all of them. So this is kind of, I'm combining information from all over or, or all around me. And I'm going to say my value is going to be a combination of all those values. And in this case, where all the these weights are one, it means that everybody around me in, and myself have the same input, uh, the same weight in terms of the importance of the information um, among each other. And that's the value that my, my, my current pixel is going to take. So I've, I've kind of, Diffused information from all around this pixel into its into its its own value, and uh, that that results in this blurring process here. So, um, a lot of times you'll see. So you have a kernel here that you are gonna convolve with, and then you have some sort of normalization factor here. And this normalization factor is the sum of the values in the kernel. And you wanna you want to normalize because if you don't. Uh, the intensity of the pixel of the entire image is going to increase by this value. So all the pixels are would go up in value by a, a factor of nine. So the entire picture is going to become brighter. Uh, so it's like the, the power of the image increases. So we normalize uh, the, the kernel so that uh, the intensity of the picture stays uh, at the same level. Um, hopefully you guys seen this before. Um, the tricky bit with the, the box filter is because the distance between pixels on X and Y is different than the distance on the diagonals, um, you get uh, artifacts showing up. And it's very tricky to see them here. Um, 
maybe you can you can look at the slides on your own, but you'll see these vertical lines in this image, and uh, um, and there's some horizontal lines, and those vertical and horizontal lines in the blur, in the blurred image are, are an artifact of the of this convolution process with the box filter. Um, to remove some of that uh, those artifacts, a lot of times people don't use box filters; they use uh, uh, Gaussian filters. So these are very similar to the the box filter, but instead of having equal weights for all the values, you have uh, the weights for the surrounding um, pixels are lower in in kind of uh, Gaussian fashion. Um, and the, the I think you're all aware of this. This is kind of the expression of a Gaussian. And then you have this uh, normalization factor here, which is the the integral of the Gaussian. So you're you're um, making sure that the you're normalizing so that the kernel uh, sum uh, adds up to one. So again, the the image brightness doesn't increase uh, when after the convolution process. Um, the why we use filters a lot of times is to um, kind of um, limit the impact of imperfections in the camera. So I haven't mentioned this, but in um, when when you run your camera, a lot of times you might have. Uh, pixels that are either they're called hot or cold pixels. So hot pixels would uh, constantly be on. So you do re report a very high value. So it would be like, um, you, I don't know if you guys play with monitors, you'd see a hot pixel is always bright. It's always white. So you'd have a black image that you display, but then one of your pixels on your monitor is always white. And that's constantly turned on. It's the same with the pixels that uh, record uh, photons. You could have them always kind of just uh, more reporting that they have a high intensity light shining on them. Um, so if you have these type of issues by blurring the image, is you what you do is you decrease the um, impact of the of these type of pixels, or you could have dead pixels, so the pixels are always dark. Um, also, a lot of times, depending on the type of artifact of the of format compression for. Uh, you use for saving the pictures, you might have uh, artifacts that show up in your image. And by blurring, again, you're kind of diminishing the impact of these artifacts. So blurring is a, a fairly um, universal process that you would apply to the, your image. So you 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 load your image, and before you do anything to process it further, you just blur it a bit. So you you you, you smear kind of the the information across multiple pixels. So um, if there's a, an issue with one pixel, it doesn't impact that region too much. Um, okay, blurring is one tool that you'll most likely use. Um, then what we'll do is uh, a lot of times you'll you'll have uh, to scale your image. You'll make it larger or smaller. Uh, actually, for scaling, I'm realizing blur is also used in scaling. Uh, so a, a simple way to scale things is to just sample it. Uh, at different locations. So if you start an image that's 256 by 256 and you want to uh, decrease it in size by half, what I could do is I could just take readings every other pixel. So if I want to populate this 128 by 128 image, I would say I'm going to take a, a 256 by 256 image and take a pixel zero, read a, put the value of pixel zero in the 128 by 128 image. Then instead of going to pixel one, I'm just going to skip to pixel two. And put that value is the next value in the 128 by 128 image. Then I'm going to sample two over. So I'm going to go from zero to two to four um, to six uh, and to eight and so on, 10. And so I sample every other pixel and then I put those values in my 128 by 128 image. And that's a one way you can reduce the size of an image. Um, then if I want to do 64 by 64 instead of 128 by 128, I sample again from the 128 by 128 every other pixel. So if you do this particular uh, scaling um, as such, so you just sample directly, depending on the pattern you have in the image, you'll get all kinds of strange artifacts. So here, for example, there's no blurring uh, being done um, when, when this image is being sampled, re 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 scaled, and at the end, when I went from 256 pixels uh, size image to 16 by 16, you can see how you have like these strange artifacts showing up that are not actually, this, this picture is not a very good representation of this, uh, of a scaled down version of this picture. 
uh, but if we apply a bit of blurring in in between sample in between kind of uh, scalings so what i do is i i say before i sample from the 256 by 256 image what i'm going to do is i'm going to blur the image a bit so i'm going to i'm going to smear some of the information from these pixels amongst each other and then i sample from it and then what i do is before i sample from 128 and 180 image to create a 64 by 64 image i blur the 128 image um, then i sample from that blurred result uh, if you use blurring, you get results that are, they do have a bit of artifacts, but they are much more qualitatively kind of representative of the image that you want to sample from, to the, the original image that you that you scale down from. Uh, so this is, an, again, why sometimes blurring is used to make these type of uh, scaling operations much more uh, high, higher quality. Um, so... Um, a lot of times when when you want to process images you you go you create these, these uh, kind of scale pyramids uh, where the image is kind of halved every time and then you apply the same processing routine to each one of the uh, this, this pyramid and then you'll be able to capture patterns at different scales um, this is a very common technique um, okay uh, we talked about blurring you can also unblur uh, if you have motion that's fairly linear, so it's kind of it, it does it moves uh, um, in a in a kind of constant fashion. You can undo the the motion, uh, and you guys can look into these links. So I put it here. It might might not help you, uh, and then you can reconstruct the image. I think on your phones now there's the the IMU, so the inertial measurement unit that can detect movement on your phone is also being used by the camera to. Uh, undistort, unblur the images when the camera acquires them. So it, it became way more fancy than uh, kind of doing it in post-processing. Uh, this is a, a technique that you'll probably use a lot. So remember how we can, uh, I talked about binary masks, so you can highlight different regions in a, in a picture. When you highlight different regions, sometimes you'll get, so just imagine kind of this is a, a character J and that you, uh, through different operations, you are able to highlight and you want to just process this part, but when the, through the operations that allow you to identify the letter J, you also have all kinds of little um, errors. And these show up as these kind of um, salt and pepper noise is called. Um, so when you have this type of these type of issues, you can apply uh, what are called uh, a, a part of the morphological transformation. There's a lot of different morphological transformation, but you can apply these dilation and erosion techniques where what you do is, so for this type of noise, where the noise is outside the region of interest, uh, you would apply first the, um, you would first go uh, erosion and then dilation. So the erosion is a process where it says, the, the, what you do is you, you check if the, a particular pixel has any neighborhood pixels that are uh, active, so that are, uh, in this case, they'll be white. And if there are any neighbors that are white, um, you leave the pixels untouched. If there are no neighbors that are white, you actually set the pixel uh, to uh, black. And then um, after you do this erosion, uh, you can also dilate. Um, so the dilation process says, okay, if there's any pixels around me that um, there's there certain thresholds. So if I have at least three pixels around me that are white, I'm going to add another pixel next to me that's white. So you're kind of increasing the, the size of the, of the region of interest of this uh, mask. And it's the same with erosion. It's it's not exactly if it's, there's one pixel, if there's at least one pixel around me that's white. It's a, if there's a, at least uh, three pixels around me that are uh, white, I'm not gonna uh, delete a pixel around me. But if there's less than three pixels that are white, I'm gonna uh, set one of the pixels to black. So you're kind of decreasing the the um, region, the areas of pixels that are are highlighted. Um, so if they remember, let's say this pixel here that had no neighbors that were white, it was set to black. So when you dilate, there's nothing actually, there's no seed to increase that uh, that area back to uh, white. So very small pixels are going to, once they are eroded to nothing, there's nothing to bring them back. But if, if you have some region that still has some white pixels, when you dilate, that region kind of is going to go back to its original shape. Uh, so when you through this process of erosion dilation, you can remove um, this type of noise here. And then you also have this, this kind of counter uh, state where the noise is actually inside the mask that you're interested in. 
So here you do the opposite process. You first dilate and then you erode. And then you're gonna kind of uh, fill your mask with the right, uh, with, with kind of a, a consistent uh, set of values that are, are highlighted. Uh, I think this is a technique that you use a lot for, for your uh, image processing and accommodation. So I just put it here. All right, so we have that. Another technique that I think is fairly useful is uh, for detecting motion. Um, and this is, um, well, you can use it for multiple things, but uh, one way you can use it for motion detection, um, kind of background subtraction. So what you do is you take an image um, and you call this kind of the background image, and then you continue to take new, new images and you subtract, subtract the background image from these new images. And if in the new image, something has shifted from the, the original background image, when you subtract these two, the region in the new image that has changed are, is going to show up as, uh, as having values much larger than zero or smaller than zero. So imagine these kind of these, if you have two pictures of a background and they're identical, when you subtract each other, one from another, all the values of the resulting uh, subtraction are going to be zero. So zero is black in an image, so everything will be black. In this re in this new image, let's say this region here stays the same as the image here. So everything that you subtract from here to there is going to stay to is going to be zero. But these re pixels here are different than the the pixels here. Now all of a sudden, uh, the values here are going to no longer be zero, and they're going to show up as a as a if you if you threshold it, you can make it a, a, a mass. So it's going to be some some value that's non-zero. Uh, and then you can look at the re the area of this uh, region that's non-zero, and you can say something about, uh, yeah, I, I see enough pixels in this difference uh, image that I can say that indeed something did change. Um, here you can see how you can kind of detect people moving around in a scene. Um, Again, another technique that I think is going to be fairly useful to you guys in uh, for the competition. Uh, some more techniques here. So, and this is these are all techniques that we've developed over kind of uh, a century of uh, building tools by hand. Uh, with neural networks, none of these techniques are are used more or less. Um, uh, as I mentioned, you can threshold, you can create masks um, or kind of grayscale images based on colors. So I, maybe I only want to look at uh, the red channel here, and my grayscale image is going to be just the red channel. Um, if you do that, you, get, you can probably do that uh, to highlight different regions in the image. And the tricky bit is that the um, uh, colors that we observe, depending on the intensity of the light, um, are going to uh, are going to show is actually different colors in in the for the uh, three channels. So here's a um, Rubik's cube that's uh, shown uh, outdoors and indoors. And let's say we only look at we we look at this red uh, square here, and it's the same. The is supposed the same red uh, color, but because the intensity changes from outdoors to indoors. Um, you would, you would see it as different, if you were to only look at the red channel, you would see it as different uh, values in the red uh, channel. Um, and then this this particular red in the blue channel, because the intensity kind of changes, it also shows up as different values here. So if I want to capture something about this particular color um, at different intensities, uh, and I just use the red, this red, green, blue color space, uh, I would need to have a very wide uh, thresholds to capture the the this this color, and I, I would probably have to look at multiple channels. So I'd have to look at okay, what are the thresholds for this red channel, and what are the thresholds for this blue channel uh, to figure out what the red color is. Another way we can um, identify this particular red uh, color is by switching from the red, green, blue color space to another color space which is called the hue, saturation, and value color space. And th there's a many different color spaces. You guys can look into this. And, I, and for the competition, people use different color spaces, and it worked. Uh, it helped them more or less, um, depending on what they were trying to achieve. But if we change to the hue, saturation, uh, value color space, um, now, instead of having red, green, blue, like three-dimensional, three colors 
uh, that get combined, what we have is these different um, dimensions. One of them would be, um, so the hues, you can imagine it's kind of on the outside here is a, is a uh, the kind of the angle in this color space. Uh, the value is kind of the intensity of the, the color. So if you stay, let's say with this blue, uh, you'd go up and down in value and saturation is whether it's, uh, you can imagine kind of black and white or colored. So if you are in this color space, if we look at only, um, so remember the value here is the intensity of the color. So it, it, when it's black, dark outside, it'd be down here. When it's bright outside, it'd be up here. So the for, for the red color here, the value changes. So it goes from dark to, uh, to bright. Um, the saturation stays the same. And then uh, the the hue here, because we are looking at red, should stay the same. So it's actually, there's a bit of a trickiness here. Um, the, the hue should stay the same. It should not change color here. So it should stay uh, as black or white. The Why we see it kind of change from black to white is because um, if you imagine kind of this as a, as a, as a circle, let's say red is at, uh, at uh, let's call it degree zero. So this is zero. And then as I go around this, uh, I go zero, 10 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees, and then I go back to 360. Um, zero and 360 are at the same location in the circle. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, and then, but zero would be because they're black and 360 would be because they're white, full white. Uh, so what we see here is this black and white are just... Uh, kind of a reflection of the fact that these two colors are actually right next to each other, but they are we are kind of wrapping around our our uh, numbering system. So they are actually the same value, but they are because one of them is kind of at zero and the other one is kind of close to 360. Uh, they look at they they look to us when we represent them here as as two different uh, very distinct values. Um, so again, kind of if you want to represent, like capture, uh, reduce your dimensionality to only look at certain uh, colors in your in your image, I would say it's much easier to first convert from red, green, blue uh, color space to your to an HSV color space, and then threshold only on this uh, hue value here. Um, so in that case, if you wanna, if I want to create a threshold. I, I say, okay, my, my saturation and values, uh, I can leave them fairly um, broad. And then I'm only gonna look at uh, a, a narrow spectrum of hues. And it's gonna be the spectrum of hues that are around the red color, let's say. If I wanna detect, let's say a stop sign or something like that. Um, so don't don't stay, uh, don't stay don't be limited just by using, by operating in the RGB color space jump around to other color spaces, the solutions that you can implement in other color spaces might be much, much simpler than the solutions that you would implement in RGB. Okay, we have that. Um, there's a lot, so OpenCV offers a lot of different uh, other uh, tools that allow, uh, that allow us to kind of highlight different regions in an image. Um, so you can, you can highlight edges, you can highlight uh, contours here. Um, so these are kind of uh, polygons that Close polygons uh, that you can uh, highlight. Uh, you can find circles. There's also line, um, half lines, and whatnot. So you can find <laughs> lines in an image. Um, look around. So these are I put them as examples of how you can how you can do these things. Um, before I go there, I think I also have in the notebook here. You'll see that there's um, we can use OpenCV to draw different. Uh, um, different shapes and text on your image. So look through here, see how how I, this was done. Um, then you can apply different transformations. This is a very famous picture. Uh, it's a picture that has a lot of different uh, types of uh, patterns. So the, the the feathers here have high detail uh, and high frequency kind of uh, changes. You have some very smooth areas and uh, kind of human features in the in the picture. Um, you'll see this picture a lot in, in computer vision. Uh, it's a test picture. Um, but okay, so we have affine transformation. So these are kind of linear transformation plus translation that you can apply fairly easily to rotate scale kind of your image in different ways. Um, another uh, set of tools that you will use a, a lot is kind of this perspective transform. So when you get an, an image from a camera, you'll see uh, that the image kind of 
shows things that are further out being smaller and uh, you have uh, parallel lines would appear to be intersecting on the horizon. But if you want to determine, let's say, if this road, you, ha you have a road that's uh, kind of turning around, you have a curve up front, if you have this sense of perspective in place, it's going to be difficult for you to figure out, well, is it the uh, road going left or right? And one thing you can do before you figure out if the road is turning, turning left or right, you can undo the perspective transform. And then you, you would go from this uh, vanishing kind of point here to having parallel lines be again parallel. And then you can look at these parallel lines and be like, hey, are they turning left or are they turning right? It's easier for you to determine whether whether um, uh, your yeah your your road is going like what what should your robot do? There's there's more to it than that though. Uh, for example, if you have um, when we get to neural networks, I'll talk about that where you need to you don't need to augment your data set as much if you do this inverse perspective transform because you have reduced the the diversity of your data by a bit. Um, to do the inverse perspective transform, um, OpenCD uh, has uh, tools that allow you to do that. So you would identify certain points that uh, you you think should be parallel or create would create parallel lines. And then you give these points, and then uh, OpenCD transforms the image so these points now uh, become parallel to each other. So the line here is the parallel with that line, and then the line at the top is parallel with the line at the bottom. So you create a perfect rectangle here. Um, th this is, is, it's fairly easy. You just call this kind of get perspective transform to get the matrix that you need to, uh, apply to your uh, transformation matrix. You need to apply to your input image to undistort it. And then this one, this line here would just undistort that image using this, uh, particular transformation matrix. Um, so you have that. These are kind of a lot of different tools that are, um, I think are gonna become useful in the, in, for the competition. Um, and now this is, I'm gonna, this is gonna be kind of the end. The, the last part of the slides here is just on a particular technique, which was a more or less kind of the pinnacle of computer vision up to probably 2008, 2010, uh, when, when computer, or 2012-ish, when the neural networks kind of came on the scene. Before I talk about technique, I'll, I'll cover a bit how, how this technique is being used. Um, so it, it's used a lot in, in it, you probably first saw it as a kind of a, a panorama stitching technique. So where you, you take multiple pictures or you use your phone to kind of slowly turn around and the phone is kind of taking a, a, a series of pictures and then those pictures are being stitched together into a, a, a bigger picture. Um, Nowadays, it's also used for, well, nowadays I'm realizing, for example, the um, iPhone has a LiDAR, so you no longer use it as much, but uh, you could use it for um, uh, reconstructing 3D images from, from videos. So let's see, this is, uh, um, this is a video of somebody's taking of this particular statue, and then it's they are using this technique to uh, stitch the different images and kind of figure out the uh, orientation of the camera with respect to the, this object when, when the image was taken. And then they can create uh, this 3D, 3D uh, object that they can then 3D print. Um, so this is another, another use of this technique. You guys can look through these uh, videos. Um, you can also use this technique to kind of uh, identify, compare if, uh, different pictures and say, is this is the the object I'm taking picture A the same as the object I'm taking picture B? Um, so if you have, I don't know, this this would be kind of a cathedral, and you want to say, is this actually the same cathedral? And can I compare it? Uh, can I compare these two pictures and figure out if that's the same thing? You can also do the same for um, you can look at different objects. So here you would have uh, a, a cluttered Im uh, image with different objects in in the scene. And you say, okay, do I see a, a shoe in the in this particular uh, image? And it could it, this technique would allow you to identify, okay, there is features of a shoe present in this image, and the shoe should be in this particular orientation in the image. And you have a phone and a teddy bear here that this particular technique used uh, is used to identify. Um, and then 
basically this technique is also used for in robotics for um, what's called simultaneous localization and mapping or SLAM. Um, and the, the way SLAM works is you'll have a robot. So here I pause it. You have a robot. Uh, this is a, a Roomba driving around with the laptop on top. And on the Roomba, we have a, the laptop and the camera. This is the camera feed. And the simultaneous localization mapping uh, allows you to, as you drive around, create a map of your environment and then of the robot's environment and then localize the robot in that on this map. So the robot is taking images continuously and then it's comparing the images it previously took with the new images and kind of getting a, a delta and seeing, okay, a feature in a previous image, where did it move in this current image? And you can see here how it kind of it keeps track of these features, and the features are kind of being move are moving as the robot is driving forward. There, these features are coming closer, and using these features, the robot can say something about the the my environment should look like in a, it should have a certain shape. So imagine kind of that uh, homography that we were using to create a, a statue. You kind of use the same a similar technique. Um, but you're now kind of creating a, a, a representation of your environment. And then within this representation, so you, can, you guys can see kind of how these features are being uh, anchored in the in this, in this space that the virtual space that the robot is building. And in this space, the robot is also localizing itself. So the robot is this blue, um, it, well, the camera on the robot is represented by these blue pixels here. Um, so this allows the robot to kind of create a map. Then once it has a map, you can use a lot of different techniques to uh, come up with ways in which you can traverse this map efficiently um, or navigate this map. So this is, ROS has, when we only talk, talk about the robot operating system, ROS has a lot of different tools that allow you to quickly build these, uh, build these type of um, data sets. Okay, so the technique that is kind of, the working force for all these different um, solutions is called SIFT, which stands for Scale Invariant Feature Transform. And what, what I did today was kind of try to compress uh, almost like an entire course of computer vision in, in a few slides. And this is kind of what you would learn probably towards the end of the course. Um, and the, the technique was developed actually at UBC. This is fairly cool. Um, it was developed by uh, Professor David Lowe, who now is a professor emeritus. I think, um, and the cool thing is that, or well, one of the cool things, uh, is that it's a it's a it's a software implementation that, uh, because of the way it was set up, was uh, actually able to be patented. So a lot of the software uh, tools that are being developed out there cannot be patented, uh, and because a lot of times the software is kind of very close to a mathematical representation of um, of a particular operation. And math, you cannot pattern math. But what you can do is you can copyright software. So at some point, you guys will learn the difference between kind of patents and copyrights. Um, and uh, but this this particular uh, technique was patentable, uh, and UBC had a patent. It. I think they uh, this is probably the most lucrative patent that UBC had. The patent expired in 2020 or 2021. Um, uh, but again, it was it was an ex kind of an extraordinary. Uh, source of uh, income for UBC. Also, the technique is probably one of the most highly cited uh, techniques in, in research. So um, I don't know, I think, I don't know sure what, if it's 17,000 citations anymore, I think it's probably more than that. So it, it was uh, the, and it still might be a fairly uh, uh, highly used technique in, in computer vision. Um, the way the technique works is, uh, it's kind of trying to simulate how, or the way I think about it is simulating how we try to perceive uh, features uh, and compare images. So um, if I go back to this image and try to figure out, okay, is this picture the same as that picture? Um, what I do kind of intuitively is I, I look at it and be like, okay, do I see a pointy uh, kind of shape up here in this particular image? Okay, I see a pointy shape here in here, okay, do I see another pointy shape on this side over here? Yes, I do. And then I kind of try to say, okay, if this is pointing up, is this also pointing up? Sorry, this is pointing up in this one. 
and then this is pointing up in this in this image then the is this equivalent one also pointing up so if both of these are pointing up in this image are both of them pointing up in this image and i kind of look around and be like okay uh, i see a shape here and i see a shape here are these shapes kind of um uh they look is again point, this is pointing up and this is pointing up is this i can compare okay this scale of this thing compared to the scale of this thing uh are the are the ratios of so let's say this the shape of the size of this uh with respect to the size of this are they the same as the size of this with respect to the size of that and i and kind of in my mind uh if i if i were to try to speak out how i would, I would tell if these two images are the same um, I'm, I'm comparing different locations in the image uh, with um, amongst themselves and then saying, okay, you know what? All these locations seem to say that the orientation or of of this image with respect to that image has kind of changed in a consistent fashion. So from this image, I went to that image and the orientation kind of changed by, I don't know, this, this whole angle, the, the angle of the picture has changed consistently by 20 degrees. Uh, and then I see similar features. So I see kind of pointy features here, see pointy features there. Um, and then if I have enough of these equivalences, I say, okay, these two images are are the same. So the the technique here first is uh, going to talk about kind of identifying key points. So these are kind of unique features in the in the image that allow me to compare two images. So if you look here, kind of key points would be these kind of rectangle, yellow rectangles here that allow me to, uh, I'm waiting for Ian to type, but, but they they will, I, once I have the key points uh, um, identified in one image and then I have them identified again in another image, I can compare these, these locations and say, okay, this one seems to match that one, this one seems to match that one. Um, so, if if enough of them match, I'll say that this particular image here is actually in this other image that I'm I'm trying to look into. Um, so once I identify the key points, now there's I should come up with a way in which I can compare these key points. So I should be able to say something about okay, how, is this particular point here? Is it here? Is it there? Where where is this particular um, location in this original image? Uh, capturing this other image. Um, and uh, the interesting part here is this technique allows you to identify these these features in a way that is scale and kind of rotation invariant. Uh, so it doesn't matter what the scale, so if, if this is a big picture, and then this is a much smaller, uh, the, the object is much smaller than this other picture, this SIF technique would still allow me to say, okay, these two features are the same uh, in, in both of these. And also it's um, al allowing me to, a very, very good point, Rhiannon. We'll get to that in a second. So yeah, Rhiannon asked if, uh, if we have very similar features, and this is a, yeah, very good point. Uh, if we have this feature in this big picture um, appearing multiple times. So uh, you can see this pointy part here could be this pointy part, or it could be that pointy part, or it could be that pointy part. How the heck do we can we tell where sh we should map it? And this is this is a very important uh, part of the algorithm, like how you identify these features so that they are what are called uh, locally unique, so they they only appear once. Um, and you would want to have features that are unique. Um, we'll we'll get into the, to that in a sec. Um, okay, so once you identify the features, you should be able to compare them. And when you compare them, you should be able to say something about, okay, are these are these two features the same or not? And we'll we'll go through how this is being done. And this is kind of, as I said, the, the pinnacle of human ingenuity, where a lot of different techniques were packed together into one big technique that has a lot of um, of flexibility and is is very is very powerful. Um, so okay, if we if we can come up with a way to compare these. Uh, features we can we can then um, match match okay say something about okay this feature matches that one here or this feature doesn't match that one there okay so uh, now it's kind of this kind of the, the almost the last slide so this is this technique this is going to take a bit um, I I put together some more things 
here. Um, the blurring, actually one thing that I haven't talked when when you when you think about blurring in uh, you'll probably take optics. Oh, man, you're taking optics too late in fifth year. But when you'll take optics, you'll you'll do Fourier transforms on images on actual uh, 2D space. And uh, you can also do that in sorry, I'm 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 going back here just because I, I forgot to mention this. Um you can do a, a Fourier transform kind of in uh, in 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 instead of doing it in time, you do it in space, and this is going to highlight kind of the frequencies of different uh, spatial components here. You'd get kind of a, this is a Fourier a result, a Fourier transform result in, in a, these kind of spatial dimensions. And then uh, I blur the image, and then the blurriness means a low pass filter, so I'm not going to have as high uh, frequencies as before. So this is the original image with a very high frequency components in it. This is the blurred image with lower, uh, after I've low pass filtered the higher frequencies. So you only have lower frequencies captured. Um, this might come in useful. Okay, you'll see. So canny edge detection. Uh, okay, that, that. Okay, so then we go into, oh, you did. Awesome. Uh, cool. Um, okay, so then we'll, we'll talk about a bit about uh, SIFT. So this is the SIFT is the technique that we were just covering here. So first, uh, the, the technique starts with um, this part, identifying key points. And the key points are also referred to as blobs. So you want to you wanna more or less kind of capture something that looks um, blobby. So like a, like a, the shape of an eye or something like a, like just imagine spots or something like that. And the way the way this is being done, so I, I'm, I'm going to try to highlight it here, is uh, the, the way SIFT implements it is by convolving the image with a series of uh, increasingly blurry um, kind of, uh, these are called Laplacians, but they're, they're, um, they're Laplacians that have been blurred. So it's, it's a, in, in this particular context, it's a Laplacian of Gaussians, and the Gaussians here is refer to the fact that it's uh, the 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 Laplacian has been is is a, being applied to a, a, a operation that's going to blur the image. Um, so the, I'm not sure how many of you know about Laplacians. Um, here, let me. This is where I have this thing here. So a Laplacian is kind of an operation that uh, the it's a uh, the second derivative. Um, you, you apply a second derivative on an image. So imagine kind of you have, uh, so when I, when I when they talk about the Laplacian of Gaussians, so you have a, a Gaussian looks something like, uh, let's see. Okay, this is the first time I'm doing this. Hopefully it's going to work. So you have a Gaussian looks something like that. Um, this is kind of, uh, oh, come on. Um, this is, uh, I don't know, let's see, this is X or the, the intensity of the image. Uh, and then this is kind of its x location or something. Um, so you'll have something like that. If you, if I take the derivative of this particular image uh, or particular data, and I try to let's see if I can capture it. So you start with see, over here somewhere the derivative. I'd say this is zero. There's nothing, nothing, nothing. And then I start to increase my derivative. Kind of increases up to here. Da, 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 da. At this point, I know the derivative again is zero, and then it decreases, and then back here it's zero again. So it goes up like this. It reaches a maxima probably around here, and then it starts decreasing. Uh, this is this is the derivative of this plot. Hopefully, this makes sense. Uh, it decreases, it reaches zero. Then I have a negative derivative on this side, and it reaches a maximum around here, and then I kind of reach somewhere around zero again here, and then it stays at zero kind of here. So if I take the derivative of this, I get this particular function. Uh, and then if I take the second derivative of this one, um, the the tricky, the why, why you use kind of the second derivative. So Laplacian was a technique that was used to find edges. Uh, so if I take the second derivative of this, um, uh, I would guess something like, so, okay, here it's again starts at zero. Um, then I get a uh, fairly high, again, derivative here. Oops, come on. And then it goes to zero here. So this one is zero here. 
uh, and then at some point, so it, it keeps going, it goes very negative here. So this is the maximum negative. Uh, okay, I get to zero here. So, uh, sorry, uh, da, da, da. so it goes negative, stays negative. Then here I'm back at zero. So this, imagine this is kind of zero again. So then I'm back at zero here. So this is, oops, so this should be zero here. And then my derivative kind of starts increasing here. And then here is back at zero. You get this kind of shape that looks like this. And this shape here, see how it looks like this shape here? Hopefully this kind of makes sense. So you, you take uh, the derivative of a Gaussian, you get this. And if you take it again, the second derivative of a Gaussian, this is the second derivative here, uh, you get something like this. And this is called the Laplacian of Gaussians. But the 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 idea was like with these um, uh, with these operations, you can you can determine what the oh man, come on, you can determine what the edge of uh, to find the line in the image. And if you were to imagine kind of this is let's say an image, and I have a line in the image here. So I have an image like this. This is my image, and in the image I have a line. If I take a like a cross section through here, and I look at the values of the pixel, so let's say here the pixels are black, so it's zero, it's zero, 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 and then when the line starts showing up, let's say this is this is where the line starts, it's gonna the value of the pixel is gonna start going up. Let's say this is very dark or very bright here, um, it's the the peak of the, the image, and then kind of on the other side, the image kind of disappear. Uh, the, the, the brightness dies down again as I move across X here. So if I want to figure out uh, where a line is in an image, a lot of times what happens is, um, oh man, I messed it up, didn't I? Um, uh, it's completely messed up. Um, what you could do is you can say, I'm going to look at this particular distribution of pixel intensities, and I'm going to look at for a particular threshold. I'm going to say, I only want to, if this, uh, let's say the value here, so let's say this is zero, and the value here is, I don't know, 255, the maximum. And I'll say any pixel above the value of 128, uh, I'm going to say from there on, if you have a value of 128, I'm going to consider you part of the line. The tricky bit is if you're, uh, if the pixel intensity, if like, the illumination changes, this threshold is going to go up and down. So it's like, it's very difficult to figure out what a good threshold is. You need to have a dynamic threshold. If you look at the derivative, you can say something about, well, okay, I'm going to look for when the, the, it's not about the pixel intensity, it's about how fast the pixel values change. And I'm going to only look for pixels that are, the uh, I'm going to say the line starts if the pixel intensity changes faster than a certain value. So then you'll be like, okay, I can put a threshold on my derivative. So the the derivative is some higher than a certain value. I'm going to say, okay, that's um, that's that's a start of a line. The other thing you can do. So the, the, the problem here is it's kind of like difficult to say, okay, what should that threshold be? Another thing you can do is you can look at the second derivative and be like, some say something like, okay, I know that so the the edge of the line is going to start somewhere you, you you can see how you have this kind of hump here and then when you kind of do a zero crossing here you know that you've transitioned from a black to the you're now kind of on this side of the line where it's fully colored so you have a zero crossing here and another zero crossing there so with this laplacian operator was used with this zero crossing ideas so you could set the threshold to be always zero so it's like when I when I see a I, I don't need a threshold. What I'm gonna look for is do I have a zero crossing where I go from positive to negative in the second derivative. If I have that, I'm gonna say this is where the line starts and this is kind of where the line ends. And when I when I look at it, it's kind of it's a it's a cross section to the image. So this is a technique that was used for det detecting lines. And now we are kind of also using it for detecting blobs. But the way we use it for detecting blobs is uh, we use it as a instead of kind of as a as a 1D plot here. We would use it as a 
is a 2D plot, and that's kind of uh, I think it's called a Mexican cat or something. It's, a, it's it looks like a sombrero if you think about it in 2D. So it would have kind of this this fancy kind of looking. I don't know if if you imagine it in 2D, you would have something like this, and like uh, big. So this is this kind of underneath here hat looking thing and then in 2d you would you would you would identify blobs more i think it's easier to think about it as a as a way to uh, when you when i take um when you apply this particular kernel convolved with this image what you'll see is that any any feature that looks like this in this image um is gonna is gonna be highlighted so when you apply convolution and correlation kind of um features that are replicating the kernel are going to be highlighted in the in the image um if you if you are to look at this particular uh, plot is like I'm, I'm looking and thinking about uh here this plot this 2d plot from above so if i were to look at it from above like this so i don't know this is my eye um so if i look at it like that what i would see is uh at the center it looks very dark and then kind of I have this fairly bright region out here. And then it kind of it's it's a darkish out here. So it looks like it looks like a blob. So if I convolve um my image with this blob, it's gonna highlight other regions in the in the original image that have blobby like features. So the idea the idea in this first step of the of the SIFT algorithm is you want to find oops, sorry. You want to find uh, the key points. You want to find regions that are interesting. These regions uh, are more or less kind of captured by by blobs. Um, so normally the operation that you would apply is convolving the image with this type of Laplacian of Gaussians. The problem is that this particular operation is fairly expensive, and in 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 reality, uh, in the real application, what we do is we we apply what's called the difference of Gaussians, which results in a very similar uh, kind of operation. So um, the difference of Gaussians, so this is what I'm trying to do here. So first of all, I, I plotted here uh, in blue, you have kind of the Laplacian of Gaussians. So I, I took the second derivative of Gaussians and kind of plotted here. And then what I also did was I took the difference of Gaussians. So I took uh, one Gaussian at a certain, at a, the given uh, standard deviation, um, and then another Gaussian that's uh, slightly wider and took the difference between the two. When we take the difference between the two, the resulting image is, is uh, sorry, the resulting shape is similar to a Laplacian of Gaussians. The, the thing is that a difference of Gaussians is, can be computed much faster than a Laplacian of Gaussians. So um, the way this is implemented is that what we do is um, we, we blur images using a Gaussian at different levels of blur. So this is kind of unblurred. This is slightly blurred. This is blurred some more. And this is what I kind of did here. I, I have this uh, snow leopard and I blur it at different levels. So this is unblurred. This is blurred a tiny bit. This image is here. It's blurred some more. This image here is, is here. It's blurred some more. And what I do is I take the difference between these two. So I subtract this one from that one. This one from that one. This one from that one. Hopefully, this uh, difference of Gaussians makes sense. And then, as you go through this operation, you look at the results. This is the result. The differences, different features in the the picture start kind of popping out, and you can see kind of the 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 spots on the leopard and kind of its eyes sometimes at some point show up. So come on. Um, or I don't know. So the, 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 what we want to look at is both very dark and very white parts of the image. Um, so with this operation, what we are doing is we are uh, identifying unique uh, blobs in the image um, by by looking at kind of these maxima at, uh, from the from the differences. Um, Another way to think about it is if you if you are blurring, remember blurring kind of reduces. If you, if you if I scroll up here, when I apply blur to an image, what I do is I I low pass filter the image, and if I have two different levels of blur, 
it's like one blur is going to low pass it like as much as this. The next blur is going to low pass it even more. And when I take the difference between those two blurs, what I do is I actually band that the result is a band pass filter. So it, it's, it's going to be the frequencies that are in one and are not in the other. Um, so the what we what we would do here is you'd kind of band past the the input image at different frequencies and then kind of look for blob for for unique features at those frequencies. Um, these are kind of different perspectives of this operation. Hopefully, if you see it from multiple different perspectives, you get a better intuition of what's going on. So we are we are looking for blobs. So how can we identify blobs? We apply this. Uh, Normally, you'd apply this operation of Laplace of Gaussians to your image, but in reality, you apply difference of Gaussians, which does the same thing um, at different levels of blur. So here, this is what this is trying to do. So for for one particular um, scale, you'll see we, we also rescale at some point, but for one scale, you blur the image at different levels, and then you subtract the blurred images from each other, and then you look for uh, what I was doing here, you look for maxima in the differences. So the maximas here would be kind of very black or very white spots. And these maximas here, uh, you would kind of capture them if they're above a certain threshold. You say, okay, this is a, a good candidate for a key point, for a, for a unique uh, blob. And then what we do is you you look at the maxima, so this would be, remember this, let's say I would look at this image here. So this would be, let's say this image here. And then I say, okay, this might be a good candidate for a key point. I'm gonna compare the value of the maxima here with the value of the maxima in the above and below blurs, uh, differences. So I'm gonna take this, this value and compare it with other values here. This value is larger than those values. But then when I compare this value with values here, I see that these values are actually larger than that one. So unless this particular value that I'm comparing, so I'm, I'm comparing this one here, is larger than the the adjacent values in it in this kind of difference of Gaussians, if it's larger than all the values, I'm going to say, okay, this is a, a unique key point. If it's not, if there's values that are larger than it, I'm going to I'm going to ignore it. And this this looks this feels to me very much kind of like what? It's very arbitrary. How the heck did you come up with it? And David Lowe kind of went through these. These are techniques that have been developed for a long time. And he just kind of combined them in different ways and uh, ran a lot of different experiments to validate that actually this, on, on empirical data, this makes sense. This, this, so he had an intuition that in this kind of, you can find blobs like this. And he applied this intuition and he showed that uh, if you have this type of algorithm, most of the time you will get uh, the right type of uh, blobs showing up. Um, so going back to our image here, um, a, a blob would probably be one of these pictures. So this would be a good uh, a good candidate for a key point. You look at this image, this particular pixel in this image, you would compare it to the images above and below it, the pixels above and below it, and also the pixels around it. This is what this is kind of trying to suggest. So you, you look at, at the pixels in the same image, I compare it to all these uh, neighbors, and I'm also comparing with the neighbors in the above and below difference. And if it's a if it's a maxima, I'll say, okay, this is a key point. So this is a unique feature in the image that I can try to identify in other images. Uh, the, the other thing we do is, uh, so this is this is one technique that we used. Another technique is we rescale the image. So we have it at this scale, we we half it. So remember how we talked about pyramids here at some point? Oops. Um, we talked about pyramids like this where you would have kind of different uh, scales of the image. It's the same thing we do here. We would rescale it. Um, and then, uh, I'm sorry, I just realized this is something. Come on. Uh, we rescale it and then we apply the same technique at multiple scales. So we would find key points at different scales and you have lots and lots of key points. So uh, the, the technique here would be kind of, let's see, so let's say I have an, an image uh, and what I do is I I have an image of a, of a house here and the house has I know, a window here. And then I have another image. So this is my image, image one of the house itself. And then I actually have this house in a much larger image and it's much smaller here. So I don't know, it's this house here. 
and then there's trees here and whatnot and the road or something or a river and I don't know clouds and birds and whatnot um, and I have the house here so what I do is first I find key points in this image so I'll say okay this is a key point this is a key point here uh, maybe there's a key point there um, so I have these three key points in this image the key points, I find them by doing this particular operation where I find uh, maxima in the difference of Gaussians. And then I also run the same operation on this other image here on the on the right. And I'll find some key points. So maybe I'll find these ones here. Maybe I'll find another one here. I might find some other key points, I don't know, that are kind of locations that are unique here. And then what I want to do is, so this is, I found the key points in both images and I want to compare key points to figure out whether I have my input image in one, the, 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 the image that I'm inputted that I have as an input here, is it present in here? So now I have, I have to, I need to find a way to uh, compare these key points. So uh, let's say in this image, I'll call this image A. Um, so this is image A, and this is image B, and I'll call these different key points. So this is a uh, key point, uh, A1, key point A2, and key point A3. Hopefully you guys can see that. And then this is image B, and these are also key points, but this is key point B1. So here I have B2, B3, and then I have key point B4, uh, B5, and B6. So these key points don't, they're not match, mapped to each one to each other yet. So now to figure out how to map them, uh, this is another technique that um, um, uh, David Lowe came up with. And uh, just one second, let me see this. this time. Um, he thought about a way, okay, how do I, how do I, how can I tell something about um, if this this particular region is similar to some other region? And the way he thought about it is he said, okay, what I want to do is I want to look at the neighborhood of a particular region. And here, this is what I kind of try to do here. So I'm looking at this tiger, and maybe I found a key point on its ear here somewhere. Um, and what I did was I can I look at this particular region. Maybe there's a key point here, a unique region. Um, and I only want to look at this area here. And I, I have this very small zoomed in picture and I want to compare this region with some other maybe in uh, so I would want to compare if I were to look at my little houses here I want to compare this region here with all these other regions here so this one this one this one at some point hopefully I can get to these ones and when I when they are zoomed in if they looked similar I can say so I'm going to compare key point a1 with key point B1. Do these regions look the same? Uh, if they do, uh, so can I can I come up with a, with a with a function that if I pass these two regions to it, it's gonna give me some sort of distance metric. So how close some some value um, distance one, and if these regions are very similar, this distance is gonna be very small. Does this make sense? Kind of maybe hopefully. We'll see. Um, it's very hard for me to figure out if you guys are following along. It's uh, it's difficult to do uh, online meetings. Um, and the way the way we go about it is so this region here. Uh, this is the actual values of that region. So you can see kind of there's a dark region here. These are low values. See how there's low values here: 70, 61, 77, 80, 77, 86, and then the other, most of the other values here are fairly large: 172. 109, so these are those values here and those values there. Okay, so um, what we want to do is we want to look at the gradients. So remember, if you look at the absolute values, if the intensity of the light, so maybe, I don't know, uh, this picture was taken when it was very bright outside, this picture was taken when it's a bit cloudier. If you look at the absolute values, it's very difficult to say, okay, what would be the right threshold? Is it the case that whenever this value is high, in this particular region, this is, and the values high here, they are the same, or maybe it's the relative intensities. And the relative intensities are captured much better by, by, by a uh, derivative, by a difference, by gradient kind of. So what we do is we look at 
for, for each one of these regions, uh, for each one of the, so I have a region, what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the gradient of the pixels around this, around, so let's say this is a, a pixel that I, I'm interested in. Um, I want to calculate the gradient around this pixel, the, the derivative of the values around this pixel. Um, I think you guys should be familiar with this. I, I'm not sure. So this is, I, I put a link here for from a Steve Brunton video on numerical uh, differentiations. Um, so this is taking the derivative, not of a function, but kind of a data set. I'm not sure if you guys took a course on this or not. At some point, you will definitely become familiar with numerical techniques, uh, differentiating techniques. So you can you can do you can take derivatives in different ways um, when you have a data set like this. Uh, so this is a digitized data set. Uh, it's not a continuous function. And uh, one technique that's being used uh, that I think, depending on if you are at the edge or in the center of your data set, you can use different techniques. So when you're in the center of your data, the technique that has lower error is uh, called the central difference uh, approximation. So what you do is if I want to figure out what the derivative of um, this particular uh, region is, so the gradient of this particular region, so this is the del operator, we have a, a two-dimensional space here. Uh, you just calculate the, the gradient in X, then calculate the gradient in Y, and that tells you what the gradient of this particular pixel is. And the way I'm going to do it is uh, I'm going to, so uh, for this pixel here, you guys can play with this, um, I'm going to find the value of this pixel, find the value of that pixel, and then on X here, I'm going to subtract this value from that value and divide by two. And that's going to give me kind of the gradient. Um, for the Y, the Y, so here I actually probably drew it here. So let me see if I have it here. Uh, the, there's a bit of a trickiness because the, the Y increases downwards and the X increase instead of upwards and the X increases to the right. This is kind of common, but the Y is a bit different. Um, so when I calculate the gradient on Y, I take this value. Oops, let's see. Can I, uh, I take this value and subtract it from that value. So this is, um, I don't know, what should I call it? Uh, y A, and this is Y B. So I just go Y A minus Y B. This this makes sense, right? This is this is fairly trivial. I don't know if I need to write it. Um, and this would kind of give you the, the gradient in this direction. And then you have X, B, and X, A here. And this would give you the gradient in this direction, in, in the X direction. And then calculate the, 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 the gradients are going to, you'll have a, um, an X gradient kind of in the Y gradient. This is going to kind of give you the, the, the gradient of the image here. So what we do is for each one of these pixels in this these regions of interest, so I will have this region here, um, I calculate all the gradients for all the pixels in this region. Then I calculate all the gradients. So for each, for each particular key point I have, I calculate the gradients around it. Um, and I'll have all these gradients calculated. So you can imagine kind of the gradients, uh, you, can, you can represent them by, um, let's say the magnitude you'll represent it. So the magnitude is gonna be uh, square root of your gradient in X and your gradient in Y, sorry, square plus Y squared. So this would be your, your magnitude of your uh, gradient. And then uh, your, you can, you can represent as a vector. So um, more or less here, you'll have the way I think about these things. So let's see, if I look at this, it would be, um, this value is lower than that value. So the gradient is going to be kind of pointing, uh, it's going to be, a negative gradient um, in this direction. So if I, I don't know, if you if you were to think about it as uh, this is my Y, this is my X, if these are positive, the gradient at that particular red pixel is going to be negative. So here, um, let me draw it again. It's going to be negative in Y and have some a certain value. And actually you can, you can see what the value is here. Uh, so I calculate here. So in, in Y is negative 16. And then on, on X here, this value is lower. So this is darker than this one. So again, it's going to be a negative gradient. Uh, so it's going to be a negative gradient this way, but it's going to be slightly larger. And then you can say something, okay, the gradient is going to be something like that. So 
we have a vector here that you're doing vector addition. Um, oops, sorry, you can't see it. So it would be this would be the, the 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 gradient at this pixel here. So what I would have is okay at this pixel here, I would have this gradient here, something like that. Um, and then I calculate the gradient. Okay, the gradient at this pixel here. Let's say this pixel. You see, it's not actually the value doesn't change much around here. It stays. It's more or less about the same. So maybe this one is slightly darker than that one. Uh, I can't really tell. Um, so it might be that, okay, these two look to me the same. The vertically, they are very much the same. So I'm going to say, okay, the gradient at that pixel is slightly this way. Um, okay, the gradient at this pixel is fairly large. So, okay, in this direction, uh, this is much larger than this one. Sorry, much smaller than this one. So you'd have a very large gradient this way. Actually, sorry, you have to take it into both dimensions. So in this direction, on X is very large. On Y is also very large. So it's probably going to be like something like that, a very large negative gradient. If you if you present it, does this make sense? Kind of what we are doing here, maybe. You're just finding yes. gradients, yeah, around the image. And this is again um, a technique that David Lowe kind of used. And this is this is what what's being represented here. So for each key point, remember for each one of these locations here. Oops, you can't see that. So for each one of these locations, so for this one, for that one, for that one, you find all these gradients. So you find you find gradients like this uh, in, the, in, a, in a region of, I think it was 128 pixels, or so 64 pixels by 64 pixels. Sorry, so something like this. So 64 pixels each around the uh, key point. And then what you get is um, you come up with a uh, for, for each one of those, uh, these pixels, you create, uh, you look at all the gradients and then you, you, you create like a histogram of, of the gradient. So what you do is you say, okay, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna have gradients that are this way. I'm gonna have some that are this way. Many of those are this way. Maybe there's a huge one like that. Uh, I have, and it's, it's kind of, it doesn't matter where in the picture they are. You just kind of list them. And then I don't know. You have lots of them. Sorry, you can't see it. So it's it's something like this. And then what we want to do is we are gonna bend the gradients by the angle they're at. So uh, and all these things are like, why the heck would you do that? And they they are all kind of techniques that we humans came up with to make. You'll see why why that that's useful. Um, but um, we we create a histogram. So the histogram is gonna say. Okay, if the angle is between, so let's say this is uh, this is zero degrees. So when you're pointing up, this is kind of so here zero degrees when you're pointing up. Uh, let's say ninety degrees when you're pointing this way, and whatnot. So you'll you'll have different angles. And then what we do is we say, okay, if the angles, so sum up all the angles. Uh, sorry, sum up all the, this This is the theta, sum up all the values of uh, gradients that are in between zero degrees and 10 degrees. So this would be it. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this this gradient, add it to this gradient, add it to this gradient, add it to this gradient, maybe a bit to that one. And I'm going to sum them all up, all the, all the, uh, the amplitudes, and I'm going to get some value, maybe this one. And then you go from uh, what are the, all the, this is kind of the, the number, the amplitude kind of of the, the the gradients. Then you go from 10 to 20 degrees and so on up to like 360 degrees, which is back to here. And then you get this histogram of kind of I don't know, different values. Uh, so you don't have in these different values what they represent is kind of how your it's a it's a it's a way to describe your local environment here around the the the, the blob, the key point that you identified. And then I'm gonna have um, in the, the the histograms here where actually it wasn't it wasn't in ten in increments of ten degrees. Uh, what we did what what he did was he created this um, he he bend the image so he made four quadrants. In each quadrant he histogrammed the the uh, the gradients so he came up with something like this. And then this one, this particular uh, combination here is kind of a representation of this, but uh, only in kind of like an, on a polar coordinate. So instead of having it on a 
you know, axes like this. He just said, okay, these are the sums across 360. Now I'm just going to keep adding things like that. And then he had four of these angle, uh, four of these quadrants. Um, and then each one of these particular uh, directions, he he had it as a dimension in a 128 dimensional vector. So can you imagine kind of if I were to capture all this data into a big vector, I would take this value, put it in here, this value, put it in there, this value, put it in here, and I would just have values here. So I don't know, 2000, 2000 something, then 50 something or something. Uh, he, and he, he kind of did the same way here. And these are, these, what we have is, I think it's gonna be in, in his particular implementation, he had 128 bins uh, across different, across these quadrants. And then these bins tell you something about, um, oh, come on, sorry, too many things. They tell you something about the, the gradients in this, in this, in the region next to my key point. And then um, the tricky bit is uh, if, if this, if my image rotates a bit, so if this image here, let's say in, in this particular uh, view here on the right, it's maybe rotated a bit this way. So it's rotated um, counterclockwise um, by 10 degrees. What happens with m all my my gradients here, so you can imagine kind of in my in my picture here, all my gradients, if the image gets rotated, they're all gonna rotate also a bit this way. So now everything, all my histograms are gonna be messed up because my zero is no longer zero. It's it now, it's well, yeah, it's gonna be 10 degrees or whatever the heck I said this way. But what I can do is, and this is again kind of like why this could be patented. Um, David Lowe was like, okay, you know what we'll do? We look at, <clears throat> when you have this histogram, we look at what is the amplitude that's the highest. And we'll call that angle zero. And then we'll rotate the, the histogram or because we call this zero, if even if in this image, everything was rotated by a tiny bit, because I'm looking for the amplitude, that's, the higher amplitude is still gonna be there, but it's no longer gonna be a zero, it's gonna be shifted. But because I normalize the, the rotation so that the highest amplitude is always zero, I kind of make sure that every time um, I compare these images, the left and right, they're both oriented the same way with respect to the key points I'm comparing them to. Does that make sense? Maybe, maybe not. Yes. Um, so, and you guys, you guys type in, in Discord if, if you have questions, but so this is kind of a cool thing that he is like, okay, I can make it rotationally invariant. So I can make this technique work with any rotation just by normalizing the, these, uh, the, the, the gradients so that the histogram is always pointing the, the top. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so now we have, we have the blobs and we have a way to say something about the, the gradients around each blob. And, then, and now what we do is we more or less um, have this match the key points. The matching of the key points, the way it works is you look at key point A1. So you go, okay, key point A1. What I'm going to do is I'll have for key point A1. Uh, okay, you guys can see that. So for key point A1, I have the descriptor. So remember, this is kind of this histogram unfurled into a, a one by 128 dimensional vector. Um, and then I have also for key point, I'm going to compare key point A1 with key point B1. So I'm comparing this one here with this one here. I'm going to say, okay, the way the comparison works is you actually just do a, a like an Euclidean distance. So you take this particular vector and subtract from this vector. And then you you you, you sum up the values. So you sum up the this these values and you'll get a single number. I don't know, some value. A thousand, 250, 25, sorry. Um, so you get this value, and this value is going to tell you something about okay, the gradients of um, of this key point here don't don't seem to match the gradients of this other key point here, key B key point B one. All right, something like that. 
And at some point I'm gonna, so I'm gonna keep comparing. I'm gonna compare key point A1 with key point B1. I'm gonna compare key point A1 with key point B2, with this one here. At some point I'm gonna compare key point A1 with key point B4. And when I do that difference, I'm gonna see, so I'm gonna sum everything uh, and then he, he, it's the Euclidean. So I, I'm gonna square all these in case they are negative. Um, and then uh, I'm gonna sum them up. So I'll get a, a, a value that's very, it's close to zero. So when I see a very close to zero, it means that this key point seems the neighborhood around this key point, the, the gray pattern, the gray scales, something like this thing here, is gonna look very similar to the gray scales around key point B4. So I'm gonna say, okay, this key point here seems to match this key point there. This is kind of how I say, okay, so now I'll say something about, okay, key point A1 seems to match key point B4. And then Rihanna brought up the point that, hey, 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 but what about, okay, if I look at, um, so let's say I have another house or maybe me in my picture here, I have a window here that also is very triangular. So I'm gonna have another key point. Let's say this one here, I'll call it key point B7. Key point B7 looks very similar to key point B4. So when I calculate key point A1 compared to key point B7, and I do my sum and whatnot, the result is also gonna be fairly close to zero. So then how the heck do I know? Should I match this one to that one or should I match this one to that one? And you won't be able to tell. And in that case, we'll say, okay, neither this this match nor that match I'm gonna be considered because it uh, the matches are very close to each other and I cannot freaking tell them apart. And because I cannot tell them apart, I'm gonna ignore both of them. This is again kind of a th the part of the techniques that uh, David Lowe kind of created. At some point, you will identify unique key points that have unique matches. And then these key points will say something about um, what is my rotation. So remember to move uh, the, the largest amplitude gradient to uh, the location of zero, you would have had to rotate everything by a certain amount. So the, the transition from this key point descriptor to that key point descriptor involves a certain rotation. It also involves a certain scaling. So when you look at this thing here, depending on where the key point was identifying the scale, um, the scale kind of octaves uh, would tell you how much uh, this house on the right, on the left was scaled down by to get the house on the right. So I'll get different matches. And then I'm gonna each each matching so key point A one to key uh, let's say B four will tell me something about so it's not only a match it's also gonna tell me something about the rotation and the scale at which the the match occurred um, and then I'll get lots of them and then I can say something about okay if I rotate this image by a certain degree of amount and also scale it by a certain amount I will be able to get this particular uh, image on this side and uh, we'll, we'll have a lab in which you guys will do this kind of where you'll implement uh, SEFT. Well, if you use OpenCV to implement SEFT, it's fairly easy. And it's gonna allow you to track uh, different objects in a, in a live camera feed. Uh, but this is kind of the technique. So um, this is the, 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 the pinnacle of computer vision uh, that was done by humans in my mind. Uh, since then, now we are just using neural networks and we don't come up with all these like sets of rules and operations. Okay, we do this, then we do that, then we threshold on this, then we compare all these key points. We figure out what the descriptors are, then we compare all the descriptions amongst themselves. Then we find the rotation. Instead of having all these set of rules that we humans came up with, we just put the image through a neural network and say, okay, I want this to be the output. Adjust the internals of your model, of your, of your algorithms in such a way that you map the inputs to the outputs I want. And we have, it's very difficult to tell what the neural network does. The neural network does certain transformations. At, at times we can tell that it does some, 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 it finds certain filters, like we have found some filters, but uh, as, as, as the network becomes more complicated, uh, we kind of start losing track of what's going on. 
and then the network just comes up with the answer. Um, so this was the pinnacle of human uh, generations of algorithms in, in computer vision. Uh, and again, kind of it was done here at UBC, so pretty cool. Um, then I am always on just one more slide or two more slides. Uh, with, with all these techniques that we covered kind of uh, in up to here, so the both matplotlib or like uh, plotting uh, and kind of identifying uh, features in an image and um, kind of being able to draw on images and whatnot, you can come up with a very useful interface that has allows you to have visibility into how your robot is operating through the competition. And I think a lot of you, what we'll try to do is kind of skip creating the visualization tools that allow you to say how well your robot is performing. And you'll try to just kind of um, build something that's like an end-to-end -end technique where you're like, oh, I, I think it should be doing this, uh, but then it's gonna be very difficult for you to debug. So a large part of this course, I think is uh, allowing you to develop enough fluency in, in programming languages and kind of operating with these libraries that uh, you can easily build tools to allow you to see how your data gets processed. And this is from, I think, two years ago, a competition, uh, an implementation that allowed the, the, the developer, whoever, I can't remember his name, I think it was Kyle, yeah, Kyle. Um, he, he was able to kind of see how his robot is perceiving the world and where it's making mistakes. And once you have this, this visibility into your data and kind of how your the, the robot's thinking operates, you can much more quickly troubleshoot what's going on. So you can you can say, oh yeah, you know what? It has problems with uh, doing the right inverse perspective transform on my, uh, this this was when we had license plates. Now we have kind of clue boards. But back then when you had license plates, it wasn't doing the inverse perspective transform properly because maybe it wasn't find the corners uh, properly. So maybe I should focus more on that. Um, and then here you can see how you, uh, they added different metrics in text so that they can easily figure out, okay, what is it? So maybe they had some thresholds on, on particular values here and they're like, okay, do all the, these clue boards have those uh, values above the threshold I'm interested in? So uh, building insight is kind of a key element of insight into your data. It's a key element kind of of doing well in the competition, I, I think. Um, okay, uh, so that's about it here. There's well, we'll take a break. Sorry for this very, very long lecture. And thank you very much for sticking around. Um, this is kind of the end of this week's uh, lecture notes. We'll, we'll just kind of have labs and office hours uh, from now on. And at the end of this lecture uh, this week, I kind of want to go through this other moment of Zen again. Uh, this is again, kind of taking a step back. We are learning a lot of interesting tools. These tools provide a lot of, uh, th they provide us a lot of abilities. Uh, and these abilities, I think, when we instantiate them on real robots and kind of in the real world are going to be able to transform things a lot. Um, the code reviews, we'll probably do them uh, just because of the snow day. Uh, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll be in class on Monday, so we'll have office hours on Monday. Uh, and we'll probably just do them in during office hours, Andrew. Uh, no code reviews for lab one. Lab one. Even if you don't, if you haven't implemented Lab One, uh, you you'll pass. It's kind of uh, it's a uh, it's a freebie for now, uh, and also for this Lab Lab Two, you actually don't need the Linux operating system to run. You can run Lab Two from uh, Windows or Mac or Linux. It's the Lab Two you'll be running it on Colab. So that's that's a uh, hopefully if you have issues with the is that your Linux installation, we still have time to troubleshoot them. This is the, the snow day really kind of messed things up, but we, are, we this is what we can do. And anyway, to, to finish my, my, my moment of Zen here, so we have a lot of abilities and all these abilities, as far as I can tell, or I mean, a lot of people are, it's not my thoughts here, but a lot of these abilities are there to just amplify our basic uh, needs and kind of desires. And these basic needs and desires evolved when we weren't this powerful, when it didn't have Kind of abilities to modify the the plant at a like a, a global scale. Uh, we could not control energies at the global scale. Now that we have these abilities, uh, we have to think carefully about how we want to project our uh, desires that were developed over kind of millions of years for I know a, a roam a roaming band of uh, kind of humans that were 
just moving from uh, grass plane to grass plane, more or less. Uh, how do we want to take those desires and kind of project them through the lens of technology into our current uh, present kind of, uh, and how that those desires are going to modify kind of our plant? I think at some point it it need we need to be very careful at how we low pass filters or our desires uh, because technology will allow us to implement them uh, to create to bring our desires into reality um, as an engineer i think you'll realize that you can do a lot of things and it's not going to be uh, the the hard part is not going to be saying uh, oh i cannot do that the hard part is going to be saying i should not do that um, and uh, i don't think we have very good uh, tools that allow us to say what should be done and what shouldn't be done. Um, and we have to develop these tools and based on kind of our understanding of the impact we have on, on the environment around us. Uh, I don't know if there's any courses on this. It's, uh, it's, to me, it's kind of a very interesting and intriguing kind of uh, new field where it's like, okay, what is the, the impact of human? You, probably, you guys probably heard of the, you're entering the age of Anthropocene. Um, uh, I think as, a, and as an engineer physicist, you have enough uh, uh, you, you, you can taste enough different domains that you you might be able to come up with your own you know kind of your own perspective of what what these tools are. So for example, for me, it's like how much power we use. So the amount of energy per time, uh, we probably don't want to use too much power. Uh, or if you use too much power, it should probably be on Earth because it's going to destabilize the system. So you think about control systems when you inject a you have a step response or you inject a lot of power into the system. You have a lot of different uh, the transients that occur that can uh, kind of destroy the system in certain ways. Um, okay, this is it. We have um, uh, we've, we've finished this this set of lectures. I think what we'll do is we'll take uh, let's see, let's take a fifteen minute break. So at half past the hour. Um, so this is gonna be twelve thirty. Uh, and then I'll be I can I can help you with code. And I think the TAs are also going to be here. I'm not sure who's that's a participant. Yeah, I'm in here. And hey, I'll yeah, me too. Hey. Yeah. Um, so I when when COVID was around and we did this, it was fairly tricky to debug things on Zoom because uh, I'm the only one who has Zoom and you guys can really share screens easily. It was easier to do it on Discord. So that's why I kind of asked people to go on Discord. Uh, you guys can join the Discord channel. And then on Discord, you can probably individually chat uh, and kind of share screen if you need to um yeah I'm, I'm not sure how much we can do today so as i said guys we we have office hours on monday tuesday and wednesday next week and hopefully those will be enough to go to the labs but yeah try it and uh we'll see how things go um so i'll i'll be i'll take a quick break but then i'll be back at 12 30. um and i'm also on discord so i can keep track of that too um, all right. Thank you very much for kind of sticking around and <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fairly painful, uh, uh experience. I <laughs> so, Okay. Um, all right. I'll stop sharing and then, uh, we can, we can, I'll just wait for people to ask questions about the labs and the 1230. Maybe I'll leave the sharing on so people know, um, restart or start on. Okay. I'll uh, stop the recording at least. <laughs>